Welcome to The Gig with Johnny O, all things tech. Today I want to talk about CPUs. Now, with introduction of AMD's new Ryzen architecture, Intel competing with Ryzen and then obviously with Mac CPUs. Just to be clear, there's only two types of CPUs, only two, no matter what anyone tells you. There's risk-based processors and CISC-based processors. AMD and Intel both make x86 and x64 CPUs. Those are CISC processors. Macs and your phone and the old server systems use risk-based processors. The difference is simple. A CISC-based processor is a complex instruction set calculation. A risk-based processor is a reduced instruction set calculation. The difference is easy. A risk-based processor is closer to the original processors made in the 1960s. Very simple design. Reduced instruction, that's where that comes from. Anything special within that program or app that runs on a RISC processor must be done in the coding. Now, AMD and the Intel CPUs are CISC-based, complex instruction set calculation. What that means is there's a lot of integrated technology in the CPU, SSX, MMX, floating point. These are complicated CPUs. They can do a lot more. And it's a lot less coding for the programmer making apps in Windows or a Windows app. These are probably, in my opinion, the most advanced CPUs. And you can see they've taken over the market. Now with the older designs, risk-based processors, you can see where they use them now. They use them in cell phones because they're very simple. With a risk-based processor, if you ever worked in IT or on servers, the, the older Sun microsystems were all risk-based. Before 2003, also Macintosh computers were risk-based processors. Now, at first, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, they were slightly faster than their counterparts being offered from AMD and Intel. But the design was so simple that as technology goes forward, the design of the CPU got more complicated. And that's where CISC-based processors come in. Now, the most recent CISC-based processors are called X64. The only difference is between an X86 and an X64 AMD or Intel CPU is the X64 can process 64-bit instruction or 64-bit thread. The X86 series are 32-bit threads. Now, risk-based processors have had 64-bit threads for, you know, well over a decade. I think even back in the, the late 90s, early millennium, they could process 64-bit threads. But that's all they could do. And it was a lot of, to get them to do anything really great, it was a lot more coding. Everything was done in the program. Where a CISC-based processor, the processor basically has a lot of functionality that in the application or the operating system, you simply have to enable. That's the difference. Um, this is why Mac computers can't play games, and PCs can't. X64 and X86 computers can play games and 3D applications. Now, we have a, a new player in town called the AMD Ryzen. AMD hasn't been able to compete with Intel for, well, since 2007, so almost a decade. However, before 2007, AMD CPUs, believe it or not, were superior to Intel CPUs. In 2001, AMD was the first company to hit one gigahertz. And for at least a few years, they were ahead of Pentium. Now, the Pentium 4, the last iteration of Intel's Pentium or x86 architecture before the dual core or core two dual, AMD actually outperformed Pentiums. Intel was second for years. People don't realize this because the I Intel marketing was so good. They have a great marketing machine. But in the end, they gave up the Pentium brand name because AMD was just slaughtering them. Now, what they did with the, the new Intel CPUs is they did exactly what AMD did. The major difference between Intel and AMD is Intel has a better process manufacturing, meaning that the, the microscopic transistors or registers in the CPU in a Intel chip are better than any other company on the planet. Currently, there are 14 nanometers. Within a year, they should go down to nine nanometers. Right now, AMD and Intel are playing 
on the same field with 14 nanometer. The latest uh, GPUs are also 14 nanometer. What this means is within the same space, you can get more processing. More registers means more processing. How they do that is they stack the processors. Instead of just printing one processor on the silicon, they print multiple processors. What this does, for example, AMD's Ryzen is 16 cores. What that means is within the square centimeter of the, the CPU, they've actually printed 16 physical CPUs. Now, because the operating system, Windows, it can process multiple threads at a time. So if you have 16 cores, it can process 32 threads. 32 threads at 64 bit at a high clock rate. So you can see clock rate isn't as important as it used to be. Having more cores on that CPU is more important. Now, Intel and AMD have a love-hate relationship. AMD had the superior design from 2001, maybe even 2000, but 2001, definitely, to 2007. They had a totally superior design. Now, there's three things that AMD did that Intel never did. Although, at the time, AMD had a better process manufacturer. They had a smaller register, uh, at least one generation smaller than AMD. But AMD had a superior design. What they did is they took the north bridge, which controls the communication between the RAM and the CPU. They took it off the motherboard and they integrated it into the CPU die, which means they printed it in the CPU as part of the CPU. That way, any processing between the RAM and the CPU was done at full clock speed, which means no latency at all. The second thing they did is they were the first ones to to take a six-bit processor and make it 64-bit, which means it can process 64-bit threads instead of 32. It was called AM64. Intel copied it, one-to-one -one copy, and called it x86. That's what you see today. It's even Intel's x86 or x64 processors are based on AMD's AM64 architecture. So Northbridge, 64-bit processor. Third thing they did, AMD did, ahead of Intel, was they printed more than one CPU core on the same die. Now, with those three things, plus a higher clock rate, AMD ruled the roost, although their process manufacturer wasn't as good as Intel's. They were always one generation behind Intel. Now, the competing CPU at the time was the Pentium 4. The Pentium 4 had none of this. There was no 64-bit, the, the, the North Bridge was still on the motherboard, and if they wanted to make a multiple core CPU, they didn't put it on the same die. They would actually take two CPUs, the first iteration of this was called the Core 2 du Dual in 2005, and they would take two CPUs and literally weld it on top of the other one and connect it. That's not what AMD was doing. AMD was printing the second CPU on the core, on the same silicon. AMD was the first one to do this. Intel wasn't able to do that until at least 2008. Core 2 Dual 2 or something. But AMD up until 2007, 2008 was still superior to Intel. Although Intel had a smaller register in their CPUs, a better process manufacturing. That's the major difference between AMD and Intel. And AMD had the superior design, Intel had the superior manufacturing. Now, what Intel did is they basically took these three technologies or these three techniques in their design and copied them directly from AMD, which is why AMD sued them for over a billion dollars. And it was settled out of court, but let's assume that they won. They basically x-rayed the AMD CPU, copied it one-to-one -one copy, and came out with their new iCore series. That's all AMD CPUs. AMD design with a better process. It's actually the best of both worlds because before 2007, you had an Intel with a better process design, which means it, uh, with a smaller register, it uses less power. You can get more registers uh, per centimeter on the CPU, higher clock rate, and it uses a le less electricity. Now, you had that with Intel, but with AMD, you had the superior design. You had the integration of the North Bridge into the CPU, you had 64-bit uh, processing capability, and you had multiple cores right in the CPU. Come up to today, you look at the Ryzen and the i7 and i9. 
the, the new Intel. Those are AMD designs. Let's assume during the, the lawsuit, which I don't know, they settled with AMD out of court, the AMD in some way gave them permission to use their design by paying them. So all this i7, i5, i3, the difference between an i3, an Intel i3, i5, and an i7. An i3 and i5, those are the lower end CPUs. They also have integrated GPUs in the CPU which means you don't need a video card. i7s are traditional, no GPU, straight up, high performance CPU. AMD's new Ryzen CPU has 32 cores. It has 16 physical cores and 30, 32 available cores, which means each of those cores will process two threads at a time. Even though it's one physical core, it'll do two threads at a time. So with 16 physical cores, you get 32 threads. And that's when you look at your PC, or when you look at that, it'll say 32 CPUs. It's actually 16 CPUs, but it's because it will do two cores at a time, it's 16 virtual CPUs and 16 physical CPUs. And each physical CPU does two threads. So it's essentially uh, 32 cores, they call it. Uh, the closest Intel can come to that design is 12 cores up to now, 12 cores. So again, right now, everyone's on 14 nanometer, Intel and AMD. Intel will, will make CPUs in nine nanometer before AMD. That always happens. It's been happening since the 80s. They have a better process, better manufacturing process than anyone in the plant, on the planet. So they'll have a different process design, but AMD, again, they've pulled ahead on the design. They figured out how to put more cores on the same die. So again, AMD still has the superior design. Although Intel has copied their design one-to-one, -one, they've come up with some new design ideas and implemented them on their CPU. Right now, because Intel has a better process manufacturing, they're able to make the L1 and L2 caches on their CPUs much bigger than AMD's. So instead of uh, making bigger caches, AMD chose to make more cores in, within the same space. That's the major difference right now. So the L1, L2 caches on the AMD CPUs, the Intel CPUs have bigger caching than the AMD CPUs, but the AMD CPUs have more cores. That's the difference. You have, say, for example, one or two centimeter square space to make a CPU, you can only do so much within that space on a 14 nanometer process. AMD chose for more cores, Intel chose for higher cache. So on a lot of apps, you're gonna see Intel with a higher performance rating. But on apps that are, are optimized for multiple cores or multiple threads, AMD will be superior because it has 32 cores and the closest Intel has is 24. Now. That's your RISC-based processors. That's where they're at right now. RISC-based processors were made by Motorola before 2003. And I don't know if you knew this, but Motorola used to make the CPUs for Apple computers. I believe they also made the alpha chips for Sun Microsystems. Or that might have been International Semiconductor. I don't know, they've gone defunct, been taken over. The difference is the reduced instruction set calculation or RISC processor design architecture is very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. What it is, it has one cache for threads waiting to be processed and it has one cache for threads going out. So one cache in, one cache out. They don't even have to be very big because as soon as they come in, they get processed, then they're pushed out. That's it, that's the design. It's the same design from the 1960s. <laughs> I'm, sh I'm sure they have improved here and there on minute improvements with their RISC-based processor design, but it's nothing compared to the CISC-based processors. They, they've had huge improvements. They're the latest technology, and they have been for over 20 years. Now, in 2003, even Steve Jobs knew this. Steve Jobs knew this since 1996, that their processors they were using weren't good enough. So what they did is they commissioned Intel to supply them, not with Pentium 4s, because there was a design issue with Pentium 4s, Pentium 3s. That's, they called them M3s. I'm not sure the exact serial number, or, but they were basically Pentium 3s with a smaller process design. That's the first x86 CPUs that Apple computers started using. Now, by this time, even Sun Microsystems was on the fence because their servers were good if they were doing one thing. For example, you would have a server 
just sending and receiving email. That's all it did. Had a very simple CPU, which is a risk-based CPU design, and it would do very simple things. These are the big industrial servers that your ISP would have, just to send mail and receive mail. Um, there might be another part of that server that might do a little bit of DNS, might do a little bit of routing too, but that's it. They did one thing and they did one thing very good. Now, as the risk-based processors just started pulling so far ahead of risk processors, now they're starting to use risk-based processors for servers and everything. That's where you see Amazon and Microsoft, Azure. So that's an old technology. However, incorporate, I, I keep wanting to say Apple computers, but they took Apple computers off of their corporate name in 2008. It's now just Apple Incorporated. They're not computers. And to be honest, they only sell 60,000 computers a year. So they're not a computer company. All their money comes from iPhones. The iPhones are based on a design, a CPU design called ARM. ARM is just risk-based processor. Very simple design, in and out. One cache in, one cache out. Cache comes in, gets processed, cache goes out. That's a 50-year-old design. They've been using it forever. Obviously, it's improved with the manufacturing technology with smaller registers, but that's essentially it. Our, our smartphones run on very old CPU design with updated technology in the manufacturing. So they're manufactured better than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They're risk-based processors. So they have the, the, the smaller register size but they're basically only used for phones now. That's where risk-based processors are. If you really want to get a good phone, at some point, they're gonna be able to, or an, a, a pad, some sort of pad, tablet, uh, when they're gonna get really good is when they're able to take CISC-based processors and put them in your phone or put them in your tablet. That's when they're gonna get really good. The reason they're not great right now, in my opinion, compared to, say, a laptop or a desktop, is because it's a very simple design. You can't get, you can't get a really great processing out of them, okay? What's gonna happen in the future is CISC is gonna keep improving, and the only thing that's gonna happen with ARM or RISC processors is the process design and the registers is just gonna get smaller. So they might still be using them in 10 years. I don't know. I thought they were dead in 2008, 2009, when Oracle um, basically bought Sun Microsystems and Motorola lost the contract to make the CPUs for Apple. I thought RISC processors were gone forever. They called them alpha chips, actually. Anyways, I thought they were gone forever. They came back in tablets and phones, starting with Mac. And then now with Android, they also use ARM, which are RISC-based processors. What's happening right now is AMD and Intel rule the roost with, for high-end CPUs. AMD has chosen a better thread processing, you know, with 32 cores, and Intel has chosen to go with uh, faster CPU and benchmarks. Um, you have a bigger L2 and L1, it's gonna give you faster benchmarks. It is gonna be a slightly faster CPU, but when it comes to multi-threading, the AMD Ryzen, the new C CPUs from AMD, will be superior on any multi-threading, okay? Risk-based processors are basically phone processors now for phones and tablets. Now. What I really want to see is I want to see CISC-based processors, the superior design, in phones and tablets. That's when phones and tablets are going to get really good. Now, there's GPUs. I haven't mentioned them, and I'm not mentioning them here. Subscriptions down below, arguments down below, questions, comments. I'll get to your questions, I'll get to your comments if I like them. If I don't, forget it. I'll just ignore you.